I'm Lynn Statton. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he said to his disciples, called to, sorry, then he called to his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The word of God for the people of God. My name is Kirk Knave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church. And today we conclude our worship series called Commit, where we have been looking at our shared covenant as members of Braddock Street United Methodist Church, or any United Methodist Church for that matter. When we join the church, we say that we will be loyal through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, our witness, and our growth. We've looked at each one of those over the weeks, and today we get to look at what God is doing with us in our discipline of giving. Let us pray together. Almighty God, thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship you. Make our hearts receptive to what you would say to us today. And may we leave this place with a deeper commitment in becoming more generous people. In the name of Jesus Christ, who gave his all for us. Amen. Whenever I think about finances, I tend to look to people who are smarter than me in those things. And I had a member of a congregation once who was the wealthiest man I ever met. I'd heard on the news, to give you an idea how wealthy he was, how he had lost a great deal of money recently because of one of the companies that he was in charge of failing. And I said, I can't imagine losing that much money. He said, oh, don't worry about me. I'll lose that much money in one bad investment. He knew his way about how to become a success. He knew a lot about how to handle money in every aspect. He was faithful in his giving to his church and many other charitable organizations. In the conversation, he said, you know, if I had to do it over again, sometimes I think I'd rather not be wealthy. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, with all this wealth comes a great deal of responsibility. See, he wasn't born into wealth. He was a self-made man. And he said, almost every day, I receive a call, a letter from a very wonderful charitable organization who needs support from somebody, and I have to decide whether or not I'm going to be one of the donors. They're asking for, for me, of course, for a major contribution. So my decision makes a great impact about whether or not that group is going to succeed. And he said, I research my charitable donations as much as I research my business investments. And I thought, wow, you have to look at what difference your giving makes. And I think most of us, that's how we look at it. He invited me to go to his main, well, the place where his heart was. It was a school in a large city where, in that neighborhood, the dropout rate was 55%. In other words, 45% of the people in that community would graduate from high school, one of those communities. And he founded a school and pulled together other people who would invest in it, and they would take kids from first grade through eighth grade. And if kids went through that school in the same neighborhood, they would have a 90% chance of graduating from high school. He reveled in the fact that his gift made a positive impact in those people's lives for a lifetime. And so he's very proud of it. What difference does our giving make? I have to acknowledge that for most of us, that's what we want to hear about. We want to know that our contributions make a difference, a positive impact on people's lives. We do that with, a, with all the organizations that we may choose to donate to. We do it also for most of us in our church contributions as well. So I'll start off this morning with some of the nuts and bolts. I've got a, a graph here that shows you how 
your giving here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church is used. It's a $1.4 million budget. You don't have to worry about that. I have to worry about that. Our finance committee has to worry about that. Uh, this is our plan uh, budget for next year. Uh, it depends a great deal on how much we contribute collectively as a congregation as to whether or not this will be fully funded. Uh, right now, it's about 1% less than 2018's budget. Um, but again, it will be adjusted according to our collective giving. And you need to know also that our books are reviewed. If you want more information, it's free. We'll give it to you. But we think most folks, you know, it's too much detail um, in $1.4 million. Our books are reviewed every year by two members of the church who are CPAs. And uh, everything is done in the up and up. And I think you can trust our finance committee to deal with that appropriately. So that's enough of the nuts and bolts. Because if you listen to the scripture, the difference our giving makes is not why Christians are supposed to be giving. In the scripture this morning, Jesus and the disciples are sitting across the way from the temple, specifically the temple treasury, and they're watching what's happening. And the disciples are like most of us. Oh, there's one of the wealthy members of the community, probably making a major contribution, and that's what gets our attention. But Jesus picks out this poor widow and says of her, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. And the scripture says she put in two copper coins worth about a penny. Now, I don't know about the inflation rate from Jesus' day to this, but two copper coins weren't worth much then. They're worth even less now. You know, we're debating whether or not we should continue to use the penny. It costs more to make one than a penny, right? But that was all she had. And out of her poverty, she gave all that she had. And that grabs God's attention more than those of us who give out of our abundance. It's why we chose this graphic for this series about all of our spiritual disciplines. It's like jumping off a bridge with a bungee cord. Are you all in? This poor widow is all in. She's going to trust God like a bungee cord, you know. She's going to trust God that I've got no other support here, just you, God. I give everything else back to you. And as we think about these disciplines of prayer and worship and giving, and witness, are we all in, or are we giving out of our abundance? I know a few years ago I gave you a, a life illustration by taking an apple and talking about, you know, God gives us the apple and each day we take a bite, you know, to provide shelter for ourselves and food for ourselves, and oh, I like that car, so I'll take another bite, you know, and by the time I was done, I just left you an apple core, put it on the Lord's table, and said, here you go, God, because that's how many of us give. We give out of our abundance. It's not supposed to work that way. When we formulate our budget, according to our spiritual disciplines of giving, God's supposed to come first. Give God back 10% of everything that God gives to us, and then we can live on the rest for our shelter, our insurance, our retirement plans, whatever else is important to us. The basis of our commitment is not supposed to be about what difference our giving makes. The basis of our commitment is supposed to be like that poor widow. We give because we love God. And the funny thing about love is, when you're in love, you don't count the cost. I was at a wedding reception yesterday, last night, and I sat with a couple of, two couples. They were both, each couple were parents. One had a couple of toddlers. One had four teenagers. And I listened to, this, yeah, all over here going, oh, teenagers. That's what that parent said. She said, oh, I, I'll tell you, t teenagers bring more stress than toddlers. And the one with toddlers said, how can that be, right? <laughs> and they each kind of shared war stories, horror stories. But as they talked, they also shared, you know, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. You could tell they love their kids. And they have done everything for their kids. They're all in. Because when you're in love, you don't count the cost. Our giving to God is supposed to be like that poor widow, based out of love. And you know, when you make that commitment, when you give something to someone you love, it, it, it just 
it deepens the relationship, doesn't it? That's what our giving does. And there are other benefits of giving that I just want to highlight for you today. As you look at what God is doing with you in the spiritual discipline of giving, one of the first things that God is doing with us is building within us a heart of gratitude. That as we give first, of our first fruits back to God, God is, it's a way of saying thank you. And you know what that's like. When you say thank you on a regular basis, it becomes a part of who you are. You're thankful for the things that you have because, let's be honest, the things that we have, the newness wears off after a while, doesn't it? A week or so ago, Stephanie and I were flying back from Colorado from a visit to see our son there, and I love to fly. I mean, the, the flight part, you know, when you're in the plane and you're looking down at God's beauty of creation and everything, I love that part. But even the newness of that wears off. As we were getting on our connecting flight from uh, Midway Airport in Chicago back here, the air steward got on the PA and went through that routine. Those of you who fly, you know what it is, right? Here's how the seatbelt works. Never mind that it looks like the seatbelt that was in my father's 1959 Oldsmobile, you know. It's supposed to protect me. From <laughs> and here's where the exits are, and here's the thing that drops down in case we lose air pressure, you know. And I was on my cell phone or something, you know, along with just about everybody on the flight. And at the end of it, the air steward said, and I personally want to thank the 14 of you who had your heads up and you were paying attention so that hopefully you're prepared in case of a crisis. For the rest of you, good luck. <laughs> yeah. He did that because he all, we all know what's going on. For most of us, it's a part of the routine, and we've heard it so many times, we can recite it back. And we miss out on the miracle that's about to take place. In just a few minutes, we'll be at 40,000 feet going 400 miles an hour in a padded seat. Isn't that incredible? As amazing as that is, the newness wears off. And we take for granted those things that we always have Never mind saying, thank you, God, for all these things that are now routine to me. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal and your electronics go obsolete. Never, he didn't say that. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the point. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. When you're in love, you don't count the cost. Invest in things that aren't going to waste away or lose their newness. Invest in things that are eternal. And in part, what we're investing in in our giving is our own eternal soul. We're becoming better people as we learn the traits, as we're shaped by God's Holy Spirit. We receive gratitude. We also receive a sense of fulfillment. I love the witness of our kids. Thank you for singing today. Um, and I love the witness of our youth. When we had Youth Sunday, I remember Robbie Ball stood in front of us and he told, told us about what Braddock Street Church has meant to him and his life, shaping his life. And and he told about his experience of sharing toiletries with the homeless in Washington, D.C. And he said the thing that, that he remembered, what stuck out to him was that after they handed out the toiletries, some people came back in order to give toiletries to the people who physically were unable to come forward and get their own. They wanted that experience of being able to give to somebody else. You know, those of you who give, you know what fulfillment that brings to your heart. The fact that you're not just going through the existence in this life, just going through the motions, but we, we get to make a positive impact on somebody else. We get a fulfillment from that. Another thing that God is doing with it, within us is making us into more contented people. That's a powerful thing. One of the commandments that I struggle with the most is thou shalt not covet, you know? That I, I know the glass is half full, but I, I want to see the whole glass full. And, I, and the marketers trick me into thinking, I need that thing in order to be happy. When in fact, God is saying, no, contentment brings happiness, not having more stuff. Or as other folks have said, successful people get what they want. Happy people want what they've got. You hear the difference? Successful people get what they want. They work hard for it. But happy people want what they've already got 
simple living, living on less, acknowledging I don't need all that stuff. I'm happy with what I've got. Thank you, God, for what you have given to me. God wants to give to us happiness, a sense of contentment. And lastly, one of the things that God is doing for us in our giving is making us into generous people. And isn't that what you want to be when you grow up, no matter how old you are? Being known as a generous person? People that other people kind of say thank you and look up to? I got that indirect thank you this week. I was down at the coffee shop on Tuesday morning, as I do on the Loudoun Street Mall, and the person behind the counter said to me, Kirk, isn't, isn't that you? And she pointed to a chair. I said, what do you mean? She said, that chair, they're, they're collecting charitable contributions for people who are suffering from the hurricanes. And it says it's from the United Methodist Church. And I looked at it and I realized, actually, that's another congregation here in Winchester that's doing that. But in the sense that it's the United Methodist Church, yes, that, that's us. You know, we haven't done that, but our, I know our church has sent a team to North Carolina to restore somebody's home. We sent another team, like, a week and a half later to Florida, and oh, by the way, friends, some of those folks were the same people. They just love doing it for other folks. It's a sense of fulfillment, right? And as she said, thank you for doing this stuff, I said, well, don't thank me. It's the people in my congregation. People at Braddock Street are doing it. I'm just kind of there encouraging folks. Every now and then I get to go and do the good stuff, but most of the time it's somebody else. But she said, thank you anyway. And, and I didn't know how to respond. Imagine me, the preacher, speechless. And I kept thinking, you know, it's, it's what we do. And I finally said something like, well, at Braddock Street, and I think most Christians understand that if your faith doesn't compel you to do something, then really what good is that faith? She said, yeah, you're right. And I just kept walking away thinking, it's what you do. Then I started thinking about those Geico commercials, you know, that's like their final phrase. Remember, there's a bunch of them. One of them that I think of is Tarzan and Jane, you know. Jane's in the middle of the jungle, they're swinging on vines. She's going, but is this the way to the waterfall? You know, and no, me, Tarzan, I know the way to the waterfall. And they just said, you know, when you're a couple, you argue about directions. This is what you do. And for we as Christians, when you're a Christian, you give. It's what you do. You don't go looking for thanks. You give because God first gave to you and God has shown you in Jesus Christ that God's all in with us. Are we all in with God? And I know we're in, and most of us, if you're like me, you're in in part, but you want to be in more. Think about that in terms of your giving. Because indeed, going back to the first idea, what difference your giving makes, I just got to say, I get comments like that one in the coffee shop all the time. Braddock Street's making a name for itself in this community in the way that it serves people who are homeless, people who are hungry, children who need a tutor, children who need food. I'm constantly finding out ways that you are in ministry that I don't even know about. I just found out this morning, one of us is, two of us actually are going to Sierra Leone to work with uh, microfinancing small businesses in West Africa. I'm like, wow, I didn't even know that. You are the ones who are doing it. And it's all supported by what we're going to do later on. As we come forward during the final hymn and we'll share together our estimates of giving, I'm so proud to be one of the pastors here at Braddock Street because of the way you show your generosity and in a sense, you're showing the love of Jesus Christ in your life because you're in love with God. Let us pray together. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to get a sense of fulfillment to be made into generous people all through this discipline of giving. Holy God, you love us so much that you will not leave us to be greedy people. Continue to mold and shape us by the power of your Holy Spirit that this community and beyond may know that Jesus Christ is alive and lives in us. And as our heart is also Broken in our community, Lord, we pray for our neighbors who need the touch of your healing grace. We ask for continued prayers for healing for Harold Og. We pray for Harold, excuse me, Ed Orndoff. We pray for Jameson Lee Thompson, 
who was born yesterday. We pray for a new great-grandson, Camden Jeffrey Hinkle. We pray for the family of Dennis Hinkle. We pray for the family of Bill Shendo. We pray for Harold Madigan, for Jessica Marlowe, for Joyce Braithwaite, for Denny Bromley and Brian Barnett, for Robbie Robinson. We pray for Noah and Isaac Flaw. We pray for Tina Anderson and Marvin Daly, for George Morris, George Quarles, Dick Harmison, Wayne Dick, for Sharon Thornton, for Alyssa, Michael, and Aaliyah Farquhar, for Barb Knight, Red Braithwaite, and others whom we name in our hearts. We pray for Justin and Olivia Bryan, married here yesterday. God, help their love grow for one another because of your spirit in their life. We pray for our neighbors whose names we may not know. We pray for our community's homeless. We pray for those who do not have jobs. We pray for our nation's troops. We pray for the people of Temple of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We pray, Lord, for all who are hurting. And therefore, we pray your blessing upon our church that we might be the hands of Christ for somebody else. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we think about giving today, I get inspiration from some of you who tell me what giving means to you. Today I invite you to hear from Kate McKay, one of our church members. My name is Kate McKay, and I attend the 10. I bought worship service. I grew up here at Braddock Street Church and went to the 830 service. My mom brought me every week, and every week I saw my grandfather be faithful to God in his giving. He was an usher and always took care of the offering plates and God's money. He loved God so much. I could see this in how he lived his life and gave his time and money to Braddock Street Church. When my thinking has changed, God has changed my thinking from thinking only about what I want to thinking about how can I please him with my giving. Giving is not only about your money. I think it's more about your heart. Giving is about trusting God and his word. I think giving is about believing. It's about asking yourself, what do you believe? Do you believe God keeps his promises? Do you believe God loves you? Do you believe he always takes care of you? Or will always take care of you no matter what? Or do you think you always have to take care of yourself? It's one way that I respond to his love for me. Um, I believe our highest calling is to enjoy God. And he loves us so much. And when we don't give, we're missing out on his best for us. What really helps me is really appreciating the money God has given me by intentionally thanking him when I spend it. This has made a huge difference. Um, like when I go to the grocery store and when I swipe my credit card, in my mind I say, thank you, God. Thank you for the money to buy this food for my family. To God at church. Um, I'm excited because I know that He is pleased with my offerings. And I believe God wants us to be excited about our giving and know that He is using it for His glory. I feel excited that I can be part of this community. I feel I feel wow, it's a gift that I have a lot to give because God has given me a lot to give. His word says that He is seeking worshipers. And I am excited to come and worship him at Braddock Street. And it's a great place to be where there are so many great people who love God. I like to watch the people go up, especially the married couples, and they hold hands. And I just think that's really cool. Or the families go up together and they present their gifts together or their commitment to give together. Um, just, it's a special time. God doesn't need our money. We need to give to help ourselves. 
so we won't be so focused on ourselves. Remember that 90% with God is always way better than 100% without it.